chair of the education committee for the Department of Neurology, so um, have uh, involvement and oversight of the neuroscience grand rounds. Uh, our guest speaker today is Dr. Lerner, and Dr. Lerner present, uh, appears today as a uh, part of the Richard Roth Lectureship Series. So Richard Roth was a faculty member in the Department of Neurology at U of L, I believe, in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, retired and tragically was later uh, died in a house fire uh, in 1998. Um, he was uh, known as for being a, a, an itinerant uh, educator and diligent with reviewing EEGs uh, with the residents even late at night. And so uh, it is out of uh, respect for Dr. Roth that we uh, have established a lectureship series. Um, in his name. And so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Friedland to uh, introduce our guest speaker this morning. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Alan Lerner, who received his bachelor's in medical degrees from Cornell and completed his neurology residency and geriatric fellowship with our group in Cleveland at Case Western. Since then, he, he's had a distinguished academic career. He's been active on editorial boards in the Alzheimer field and played important roles in the Alzheimer disease neuroimaging initiative, known as ADNI, as a member of the steering committee. He has been involved in the management of Alzheimer's clinical trials and the Alzheimer's disease clinical trial consortium and other data safety monitoring committees. Alan serves on the steering committee of the National Football League Concussion Settlement Award and has also served as PI on numerous NIH grants and as well as research projects funded by individuals and foundations. He's played a pivotal role in several important clinical trials in the Alzheimer area. He has over 130 peer-reviewed publications, often in major journals which have addressed all of the Alzheimer and related disorders issues from diagnosis, pathophysiology, and treatment. His papers have always been thoughtful, comprehensive, reliable, and important. Alan and I worked together in the same clinical program for over 18 years, and his patients and families recognized and appreciated him for his thoughtful and compassionate care. I look forward very much to his talk on the biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. Rob, that was, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you, can you, you can see my presentation, hopefully. Okay, we'll put it in full. Okay, so we're, uh, good morning and what an honor it is to be here for this uh, grand round. Uh, on Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. Whoops. Uh, before we get started, uh, Lilia wanted to remind everybody CME code is 1281900. Uh, and it's very important to get the credit uh, for this event. Um, I get there's no disclosures regarding this presentation. I'm not going to talk about any um, off label or other kinds of usages like that. Um, okay, you know, I don't do this alone. Um, there's somebody in the top row you should probably recognize. <laughs> and uh, uh, we could spend an hour talking about who these people are and what their role is in uh, advancing uh, our understanding of uh, cognition and human aging and the aging brain. Uh, so we'll just get on with, uh, uh, there's the one, uh, Dr. Friedland, uh, right here and a younger, <laughs> younger days. Uh, we're going to talk about the new Alz what I call the new Alzheimer's disease. Some, some, a little bit about normal cognition and racial and ethnic diversity. Uh, the important topic of subjective cognitive impairment and why you should care about it. Uh, and then go through biomarkers, especially the context of use that's been uh, the framework <clears throat> uh, that the FDA has. Put around it, and I think if you understand the context of use, you'll understand uh, where biomarkers are going right and where they're going wrong. Uh, and then we'll talk about different classes of AD biomarkers and leave some time at the end. Um, you know, this is the World Health Organization infographic. It's a few um, years old. 
there's probably more people uh, in uh, with dementia. Um, one of the interesting things for me in this infographic is that half of the cases of dementia in this world are in Asia. Uh, and uh, we tend to think of this as a American and European disease or North, Northern Europe disease, but actually dementia, uh, you know, in all types is actually most common in Asia um, rather than in uh, America and Europe. So the <clears throat> so from the old times, you know, this was the disease you didn't know you had till you were dead, and there was no treatment. You went to a the big question was, do you go to a nursing home or not? Uh, we knew that there were some risk factors like age and maybe some family history, uh, and that you couldn't know that you had it, uh, therefore you lacked insight, which is probably is pretty wrong. Um, and, but then there's the new Alzheimer's disease, which is more biologically based uh, and it involves early recognition, uh, not necessarily the therapeutics uh, involved in that. Uh, we have new care models. Uh, we're going to talk about biomarkers today. We, we've recognized that there are genetic markers like APOE, apolipoprotein E, and some of the early onset um, uh, Alzheimer cases. Uh, due to particularly presenilin-1. Uh, there are environmental risk factors, and we focus on quality of life and prevention. So this is, you know, uh, from the time when I was a fellow with Dr. Friedland. Some of this is like science fiction. Uh, I must tell you that I'm very honored to have been part of this, but because some of the things that we're going to talk about today were just, you know, if you talked about them 30 years ago, they would have looked at you and probably sent you to the psychiatrist. Um, and so we have large clinical state, uh, studies, and big data has certainly helped us. This is a slide I made uh, a number of years ago, um, you know, er, focusing on early diagnosis, biomarkers, and early treatment. And mild cognitive impairment may be too late to, to, uh, to intervene. Uh, but, you know, the other idea, two other ideas that are important from this slide, one is that normal changes over time that as you get older, uh, what is normal, and we'll talk about this uh, in a couple of minutes, some more detail. The other thing that's really interesting, is, and baked in the cake of this sinusoidal uh, decline, is that the rate of change changes, the, the tangent uh, to the curve. And so as people get more severe, they'll come in the office and you sort of know you know, the family is rolling their eyes and like, you can't believe it uh, because the rate of change does change. So it does seem to uh, accelerate. Um, there are many reasons that's really a different talk. Okay, so we had a clinical diagnosis. We've had that for a very long time, but we have now biological definitions that are beginning to uh, certainly in the research world and are making their way into uh, memory clinics across the uh, United States and Europe. You know, the first thing to recognize is that cognition is one, not one thing uh, before we get to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's memory. With, uh, the memory is actually quite complicated with its terminology. Um, we talk about executive function, planning, judgment, thinking, reasoning, and judgment. Uh, language, visual, spatial, and behavioral. And memory has, for a long time, had a privileged position that you had to have a memory problem. Um, and uh, that has, it's been dethroned to some extent, but uh, it still dominates much of our thinking. Now, the, <clears throat> this is from the Maastricht Area Aging Study. Maastricht is in the Netherlands. And um, a kind of study where they went and did an epidemiologic study. And you can see when is over the hill over the hill, and when do things start to change? And really, the only thing that stays um, pretty stable is uh, vocabulary knowledge, uh, and the uh, that um, block design episodic memory. Uh, these are the scores, and these are the standard deviations here. So um, this is uh, important, you know, with if you look at like professional baseball players, you know, the designated hitter phenomena, um, and when you're paying somebody $10 million a year, you can, at age 32, you can already tell that they're not as good, they can't hit the, uh, 
uh, fastball, but they can still hit the slider. Uh, so uh, this is an important, this is how normal changes over age. Um, we, t we talk about uh, screening tests, you know, cognition, cognitive exams have actually been pretty good. Um, they have, one of the reasons we don't have that many validated biomarkers is it's actually fairly difficult to do better than clinical evaluation. Uh, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment uh, has uh, uh, become very popular, and I'm going to draw everybody's attention to this little thing right at the bottom, which just says normal is 26 over 30. This is actually the Spanish version of the of the MOCA. Um, so is this really true? And I think this is actually very pernicious, to be honest, and you'll see why in a second. So I was part of the, very honored to be part of the SPRINT study. This is the hypertension study, it was NIH trial of the year. Uh, looking at 140 over 90 versus uh, 120 over 80, uh, enrolled 9,300 people. And we have here for high school graduates, uh, the 90th, uh, 50th, and 10th percentiles uh, and, and the line. So this is the, blue is the Caucasians, uh, our, uh, orange is the African Americans, and gray is the Hispanics. And so these top three are the 90th percentile, uh, the 50th percentile, and then the 10th percentile. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about this. You see the age changes of normal, uh, 50th percentile is the median, uh, that changes over age. You see that the curves are actually fairly parallel between the groups. Uh, by the way, there were about 40% minorities in the SPRINT study. Uh, so there's a, there's a robust uh, minority group. But if you now look, at, think about a clinic visit and an 85-year-old African-American man, uh, where am I, can you guys see my pointer here? Rob? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is the 50th percentile of the Hispanic and African-American lines, okay? Not 26, last time I checked, a median or an average is not impaired. Uh, it's 18, 17 or 18 not 26, and I, we have to be, I'm concerned about the rate, risk of over-labeling mild cognitive impairment. Uh, we know that things change, so, you know, even the 10th percentile is not the one, minus 1 1.5 standard deviation, and 10th percentile here would be uh, 14 or 13. So we really, at, at age 85, and so many patients may be earlier, but even earlier, if you look at a 75-year-old, um, Median for African Americans and Hispanics was 20 in this study. So th there's really got to be a reckoning here about what is normal, and this is really an important issue, as especially as we get into biomarkers, what, how these might vary between uh, racial and ethnic groups as well as gender. Um, a very brief <clears throat> digression into subjective cognitive impairment. We shouldn't really be calling this the worried well. In fact, these are, in, from a clinical trials perspective, are the most valuable patients. And this study uh, looked at 213 people and 166 people with subjective cognitive impairment. Followed up for six, almost seven years. And what did we get? We got, uh, in this uh, Group. Uh, 90 of those went on, more than half went on to develop uh, cognitive impairment over those years. So these are really the most valuable patients. They're, well, they're awake, they're alert, they're oriented, they're leading their life, they have a memory complaint, and we really have to be uh, more cognizant of this uh, subjective cognitive impairment. Then there's different definitions and uh, different uh, versions of this. That's, you know, what, what are the diagnostic criteria for SCI, but uh, it is an issue, as, and we'll talk about this as we get into the biomarkers, you'll see where this uh, plays in. Um, this was the, uh, another uh, later thing. Uh, you can see the people with moderate, were very worried, uh, were more likely to be APO, uh, e, uh, uh carriers. The highest uh, people who were very people with subjective memory complaints who were very worried uh, had a higher uh, ApoE4 uh, genotype. Um, they tended to be on more medications. 
their global cognition scores were lower. So uh, th there is something here going on. There is a signal uh, that is going on even in people with subjective memory complaints. Uh, these, like I say, if we're going to intervene early and we think that early intervention is important, it's important in cancer. We don't wait for the uh, pea-sized tumor to be the lemon-sized tumor or the grapefruit-sized tumor. Um, we don't wait for you to be gurgling pink fluid uh, to treat your congestive heart failure. We don't wait till you're in the ICU with uh, profound sepsis to treat your urinary tract infection. If we're going to treat early, uh, we really have to focus on uh, people at this uh, stage. And this, For some people, this already may be secondary prevention. They may already be accumulating amyloid. So biomarkers. So the FDA has um, a framework, and you can find this on the FDA website, uh, for biomarker categories. And we're going to go through this in some detail. So there's diagnostic biomarkers. And we also have a context of use, well, you know, selecting patients uh, for participation in a clinical trial. Monitoring biomarkers, detecting a change, indicating safety. Um, Predictive biomarkers, which are <coughs> which are different than diagnostic biomarkers, because you're trying to predict uh, who might uh, 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 benefit from a specific intervention. Prognostic biomarkers, pharmacodynamic response biomarker, safety and susceptibility. And we'll talk about the, each of these categories in de detail. So a biomarker. A diagnostic biomarker is used to detect or confirm the presence of a disease or a condition of interest. Um, an example that it's sweat chloride may be a diagnostic biomarker uh, to confirm cystic fibrosis. Uh, the GFR may identify people with chronic kidney disease. Uh, the ejection fraction for people with heart failure. So these are uh, pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, you know, people, a, the hemoglobin A1C may be a diagnostic biomarker of uh, type 2 uh, diabetes. Then there's monitoring biomarkers, and these are measured repeatedly for assessing the status, uh, such as use of uh, the inter INR and PT, to assessing whether uh, warfarin is uh, at having the desired effect. Uh, monoclonal uh, proteins, for those who are interested in neuromuscular disease, may be used as a monitoring biomarker uh, for people with MGUS uh, who may progress to uh, a lymphoma, for example. And the PSA may be used as a monitoring biomarker. So this is uh, this is slightly different than the diag, and it depends how where you start is going to be, you know, is going to determine where you end with these. Then there's bio response biomarkers. Uh, there's biomarkers of pharmacodynamic biomarkers, and then there's the whole concept of surrogate endpoints. A surrogate endpoint does not measure the clinical benefit, uh, but rather is expected to predict that clinical benefit or harm uh, may occur. So this was maybe, if you think about the recent uh, FDA approval of aducanumab that used a, uh, a reduction in uh, amyloid PET, uh, um, the amyloid levels as the surrogate biomarker, unfortunately, did not really predict uh, clinical benefit in that case. Uh, then there's predictive biomarkers, such as BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, so these are, uh, you know, can, can you find a biomarker uh, that will, such as a protein that might predict whether you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease? And we'll talk about that when we talk about CSF uh, later. And there's prognostic biomarkers, um, somewhat similar to the, uh, the last category. Um, um, so BRCA1 may be used to assess uh, prognosis, uh, to assess the likelihood of a second breast cancer. So these, each of these has, like I say, from the FDA website, there are, there are a number of uh, um, uh, examples, uh, concrete examples, that may be used. Safety biomarkers, for example, people, HLA-B1502 uh, 
should be used to screen patients for, uh, regarding the use of Tegretol, carbamazepine, uh, for those who are at risk of serious and fatal skin reactions. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, particularly in Asian individuals. And then there's surrogate end, endpoints uh, uh, that are, have been validated, systolic blood pressure and the occurrence of stroke, elevated uh, LDL, FEV1, and HIV viral load. And then they can be characterized by clinical val. Some of them are validated, some of them are reasonably likely surrogate endpoints, and then there's candidate surrogate endpoints. Now, talking back about Alzheimer's disease, this is the graph that really um, everybody thinks about. Uh, this comes from uh, Adney Cliff Jack at Mayo Clinic. Uh, uh, was instrumental in putting this together. The idea that dementia is really not the first thing that happens, it's the last thing that happens. And if we're going to understand, this would be like trying to understand kidney disease by looking at people with end-stage renal disease. Um, so if we're going to understand the pathophysiology, we really have to look at uh, normals or people with SCI, as I sort of um, uh, indicated earlier. And it's thought that the amyloid starts um, uh, going up <clears throat> as much as 20 years prior to uh, clinical symptoms. This represents a window of opportunity for interventions. Uh, why the amyloid starts going up, that is the gazillion dollar question. Was it, is it just an epiphenomena uh, or does it really mean something? Uh, and why does that uh, then initiate uh, tau um, uh, uh, increases in the in the brain. That and now we've known that amyloid is a very poor predictor uh, on a, for for localizing lesions, and its correlation with brain region uh, is um, is quite poor. It does seem to involve areas that are tonically active, such as the posterior cingulate, which is part of the default mode network. Um, but uh, FDG PET is actually pretty good, uh, and FDG PET is FDA approved uh, for the use in uh, diagnosis of uh, dementia. Okay, and this has led to the so-called ATN framework for uh, staging preclinical Alzheimer's disease, starting with uh, taking from the graph asymptomatic amyloidosis, showing how you might. Uh, 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 diagnose this uh, either by PET or CSF, uh, then amyloidosis plus neurodegeneration, uh, the tau uh, starts to change. Uh, you may see changes on FDG PET, uh, cortical thinning, uh, hippocampal atrophy on uh, MRI. And lastly, uh, cognitive decline is, is really the last stage of this uh, framework. So this is uh, uh, really driving the field at this point is as we develop new biomarkers, does how does it fit into this framework, the ATN framework? Now, <clears throat> there are different classes of AD biomarkers, some of which uh, uh, we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about clinical biomarkers. Uh, we're going to talk about MRI, um, uh, PET, CSF, digital, and plasma. So I'm going to dispense with MRI pretty quickly here. MRI, while widely available, uh, moderate cost, non-invasive, uh, is actually not as good as people thought. Everybody thought that there was going to be a, this three-way race between CSF, PET, and MRI. And MRI was going to win because MRI is available. It's relatively cheap. It's not radioactive. It's non-invasive. Uh, but it's not actually that as good. Um, uh, measuring cortical thickness is actually quite a trick because of the trying to uh, estimate the thickness of a three-dimensional curving structure is, is, is no mean feat. Uh, so maybe new sequences uh, will, are being developed uh, that may help us, um, but we, uh, I think people have started to look beyond MRI. Now, PET is sensitive, uh, but not widely available. If you're in Montana getting um, uh, ligands to that PET center, maybe it um challenge now for example i'm in cleveland ohio 
Uh, now, amyloid ligands, such as flobetapir, are, are, are synthesized locally. However, if we're going to do tau pet in a research study, it actually has to come from New York City. It has to be made in New York City, flown to Cleveland on the same day. Uh, it has to get there uh, before the uh, pet technician leaves at 4 p.m. Uh, it's expensive. It's radioactive. Um, we're developing new ligands, some of which uh, uh, may be better, and we'll talk about that. We'll see some PET scans. Now, CSF is sensitive. Uh, it does require some um, differences, such as uh, polypropylene tubes. Now, uh, the typical tubes that come in the uh, kits are polystyrene, and amyloid actually sticks to polystyrene, probably something to do with negative charges. On the on the surface of the of the polymer, how so uh, you may not get accurate uh, amyloid CSF amyloid levels if you use the polystyrene tubes. You got to use the polypropylene. We'll talk about this. And there's very few CLIA certified labs, if any, in the United States. So there are, although it's easy to do with the CSF, getting it to a CLIA certified lab uh, is not um, not easy. We're going to talk about digital. Uh, biomarkers, very interesting, promising. Maybe there are technical issues. Uh, the cost is low. This is be things like the cookie theft picture and language, uh, a uh, lang natural language processing to assess things like sentence length, use of nouns and verbs, uh, how many ers and ers there are, uh, et cetera. And then plasma biomarkers, which have uh, some of which have reached the uh, commercialization stage. So this is our CSF biomarkers protocol. Um, here you can see a polystyrene tube versus polypropylene. Uh, we use a non-traumatic needle. We have a very nice protocol, which we do these uh, in the mornings fasting. Um, we, uh, we do them sitting up. Uh, we collect according to the protocol. Um, now, if you keep the subject talking, every time you talk, you a Valsalva maneuver, uh, little Valsalva maneuvers. Uh, CSF pressure is related to right heart pressure and makes your CSF, your taps go faster, as well as calming the patient down. We always play the music of the subject's choice. We've done um, them to uh, Toby Keith and Jimi Hendrix and Mozart and Smooth Jazz and Little Nas X and every genre in between, uh, The Grateful Dead, uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, so we we do that, and then we just have them lay down for 30 minutes, and then give them their breakfast and follow them up. Now, there's a lot of questions about what is the best biomarker in CSF, and you know, so tau or phospho tau here. Uh, there's you know, if you the more you look at this, the less you're going to be convinced. Uh, what is the best uh, species of tau? There's like 25 different species in tau. Uh, tau is alternatively spliced into three repeat tau and four repeat tau. Uh, and so it is thought that uh, CSF uh, phospho tau 217 may perform better. Uh, but you can see one of the things that you're going to see here is overlap between groups. This is the heterogeneity of Alzheimer's disease, it's a disease of weak signals. Uh, we probably found most of the strong signals, age, family history, apolipoprotein E. Uh, how many st more strong signals do we have out there? Not clear, uh, but there's lots of weak signals. And so you can see, you can see the, the, that there's a fair amount of noise in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, in all of these biomarkers and uh, considerable overlap uh, between groups in this. Uh, sorry, it didn't uh, 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 copy so well. Now, as we're going on to PET and the preclinical AD, and so we now, we, we just said that beta amyloid starts 20 years prior to uh, clinical symptoms. So there is a tenuous relationship between A beta and neurodegeneration cognition. Uh, you can see the famous Silverstein picture. Uh, here, but so we have a new class of people out there who are called uh, amyloid positive normals, and this is an interesting group. Um, do they do as well? We'll talk about their cognition in a minute. And then there's neurodegeneration, which occurs later. And as we said, this is the ATN uh, framework.
So <clears throat> you might see this is in uh, somebody with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I think this may be Pittsburgh compound B. Uh, you can see uh, the accumulation, particularly in frontal and parietal association cortex, uh, the amyloid positive normals on the way, and an amyloid uh, negative. Now, the other thing to recognize is that there is a lot of nonspecific white matter binding. We have a nice, very uh, nice picture of the white matter, major white matter tracts. Here are the corpus callosum. Um, and you would typically see this fingering pattern that helps you determine when the when you get a amyloid cortical amyloid, which is what we're really interested in, you tend to get this glomming up, and it tends to smooth out, and you lose this kind of fingering pattern. It's one of the major ways to t look at uh, uh, amyloid PET scans. Uh, this is from the Harvard uh, uh, Aging Brain Study. Uh, so careful evaluation of the blue line, healthy uh, adults, healthy aging, A beta negative and A beta positive, suggests that over 36 months, there actually is a difference uh, between uh, people who um, are quote unquote normal, that the amyloid beta, um, uh, people who are accumulating amyloid beta actually are starting to decline ever so slightly with better tests. Uh, this is uh, uh, verbal memory here, uh, baseline uh, 18 and 36 months. So um, th we, we need to, oh, this is visual memory on this side. You can see here visual memory, somewhat, somewhat uh, similar pattern. Uh, interestingly enough, the A beta curve is actually pretty parallel to M uh, MCI who are A beta positive as well. Okay, so there's interest, you see effects of aging, um, but uh, the only group that improved was the MCI A beta negative. So about half of MCI patients, uh, mild cognitive impairment patients, uh, are A beta uh, positive or negative. <clears throat> now, tau PET has been developed. Um, and this is a slide from Bill Jagus that showed at one of the ADNI meetings. Um, and it shows tau, tau parallels AD phenotypes using AV1451. Uh, um, I was I did one of the first in man uh, tau PET and uh, contributed a patient to that study. Um, how I got involved had to do with a family member uh, of a son-in-law of the patient who worked at Siemens, who developed uh, the first uh, tau ligands. Uh, and I got involved in that study. Here's somebody with uh, posterior cortical atrophy, the visual variant of Alzheimer's disease with relatively uh, preserved MMSE. And you can see here in the left occipital lobe and a little less in the right occipital lobe, uh, uh, the accumulation of tau PET. This is somebody with logopenic uh, primary progressive aphasia, uh, which is the um, PPA that is most associated with beta amyloidosis. Uh, once again, uh, you're seeing um, more here in the left hemisphere, uh, which you would expect, particularly in the parietal lobe, uh, which helps distinguish it from the other forms of uh, primary progressive aphasia. And here, somebody with the, I'm not going to call it garden variety, we know that in Alzheimer's disease, the earliest uh, places that uh, tau will accumulate is entorhinal cortex and then spreading to the hippocampus. So you can see here in the uh, basal uh, temporal lobes, you can already see this. Now, if you extend this uh, logically, um, or at least compare the two, uh, this is from Keith Johnson. At, at Harvard, uh, PIB versus T807, which is uh, AB1451. Uh, you can see the different uh, uh, geographic um, depositions. Now, how, how these relate to each other, that's a really an interesting question. We've known that it's a very complex relationship. Why is, why is there so much amyloid in the frontal uh, association cortex but no tau? Are these really uh, uh, related, uh, hooked? together, uh, uh, you know, 
um, processes or are they really separate processes and why does one follow the other? Um, here you can see the uh, tau deposition and looking at uh, this. And this hints at the really the next thing, uh, which is the possibility that sounds like science fiction of in vivo Brock staging. So Brock and Brock uh, did some staging of both uh, AD and Parkinson's disease. And this idea here that you see it uh, starting in the transentorhinal region, going to a limbic phase and then cortical uh, stage. And you can see tangles and amyloid are taking different trajectories. This is, like I said uh, at the beginning, this is kind of science fiction, this idea of in vivo Brock staging. What have we learned? There's actually several different patterns of tau uh, deposition, and this was kind of an oversimplification, if anything, in the people that the tau uh, deposition uh, and amyloid deposition, for that matter, is probably more complicated and may, uh, and people vary from uh, one to the next. A little aside here, um, they talk about uh, what, whoops, the people who do tau pet like to talk about off target binding. It's meaning, okay, you see a little bit here in the possibly in the medial temporal lobes, okay, but you're seeing, I see this regularly, and I'm a, a bit concerned about it is that the tau uh, accumulate, tau ligands bind to retina. Uh, almost uniformly, and so I know there's amyloid in the in the uh, in the retina. There may well be tau and uh, some tau binding uh, in the retina, and almost everybody. So it's called off-target binding. Do I want to be radiating my retina or my patient's retina? No, um, but uh, so there there are issues with this uh, kind of uh, these kind of ligands and what is generally dismissed as of no clinical importance uh, because it's quote unquote off target. Now, plasma biomarkers have begun to become, uh, started to become uh, uh, commercially available. Uh, the Roche uh, product and uh, has oh, now through Quest, well, Roche owns Quest uh, uh, to detect this in, um, in plasma using a amyloid beta 42 to 40 ratio. Again, note the large level of um, overlap uh, between the two groups. Uh, but you can now begin, and now there's a very robust p-value, okay, it's 10 to the minus 16th. However, uh, you know, if you're here, if, you know, if you're here, maybe you can't really tell whether you're negative or positive. And so uh, the, these uh, tests, uh, Certainly, you know, we have to remember what is the context of use of these biomarkers? What are we trying to accomplish here uh, with these biomarkers? And who are these people? Are these normals? Are these people with Alzheimer's disease? A little bit unclear uh, from this slide who these people really are and what clinical stage. Are they normal? Well, that would be pretty important. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, I'm not going to show this. <clears throat> The precivity is a uh, uh, proprietary um, amyloid detection algorithm uh, based on plasma from C2N, which is a company out of uh, Washington University at St. Louis, uh, Randy Bateman and uh, uh, Holtzman, Dave Holtzman. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm not going to show their very slick video. Uh, about this, but they say claim it has about 70% um, ability to, t they, they develop what's called an amyloid propensity score uh, or positivity score. Here you go. Uh, this is from their website, the distribution of the amyloid probability scores. Now, we are actually using this in the so-called AHEAD study, A345, to screen because if you uh, otherwise, if you just take older people and do tau amyloid PET for clinical trials, you end up with about an 80 to 90 percent screen fail rate. So, in order to improve that, we we have started several groups have started using uh, the uh, C2N uh, precivity measures uh, to in to increase the uh, yield of amyloid PET, and it's, it does seem to be working. 
Um, this has been published now. Um, uh, it, it does use a uh, proteomic approach to, to uh, determine your APOE uh, genotype, which also gets figured into, like I say, it's a proprietary algorithm um, and to trying to optimize the positive and negative predictive values. But as in everything, there is people, there's a certain probably 10, 15% of people who end up with an inconclusive test. Uh, and so this has been the subject of some ethics uh, papers recently by uh, the Agree Dementia Group, uh, Doug Alasco, and uh, I wrote a paper about this, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, well, how do we deal with this problem? And I think that it really comes back to what is it that we're trying to accomplish under the FDA biomarker uh, framework? Are we trying to diagnose Alzheimer's disease? Really, we seem to be looking at cerebral amyloidosis, if you're being really honest. Uh, does somebody with amyloid really have Alzheimer's disease? Uh, not in the traditional sense, necessarily. Um, you know, that person with the amyloid positive normal, should they be uh, applying for disability because they have, uh, quote unquote, Alzheimer's disease that's been diagnosed by uh, tests that with uh, a lot of overlap? <laughs> this is a, a really a very important issue. Now, these plasma biomarkers as predictive is really interesting. Um, here we see three slides, uh, three groups, amyloid, uh, three measurements, amyloid beta uh, 42 to 40 ratios, uh, the plasma P tau and the plasma neurofilament light or NFL, uh, which is not specific. Looking at those who are positive on some scheme like we've just seen, and can you predict over six years? So these things are really powerful. Uh, we, should, we, we have to understand that if you have an elevated, if you're P tau uh, 217 positive, that it is likely, you know, these are 95% confidence intervals, that six years from now, you're going to be performing significantly worse than the people who are negative. Now, this is really powerful. This is coming. It's here. Uh, we need to be, and this is using a uh, the PAC, which is a, a semi-computerized uh, battery of uh, cognitive tests that can be uh, delivered via iPad. So these are these things are really powerful, and we really have to understand their use because uh, the NIH, having spent you know untold millions uh, on, uh, encouraging this sort of thing, uh, now we have this technology. But what does it mean in, in the individual cases is still really rather a challenge. Uh, the risk of AD this is the same thing. I mean, look at this. Uh, you know, PTAU 217, you go and get that done at, uh, you know, Quest during a clinical trial. I mean, six years from now, your chance of having Alzheimer's disease is 20%, you know, 25%. That's pretty high. So these are really uh, very powerful uh, measurements. Uh, but you have to recognize what else you're doing in these six years. Are you uh, practice, Are you doing brain games? Are you eating healthy? Have you are you doing physical exercise? Do you have a family history? What is the gender difference? We talked about racial and ethnic differences. All of that has to be folded into this. I'm probably sure that this has not been studied in uh, diverse communities and. There is evidence that tau levels are different in African Americans than in uh, Caucasian populations. Probably hot, slightly higher in uh, African Americans. But is P tau 217 really the best predictor? Is it T tau, P tau? You know, is it something with C terminal uh, fragments that are better? Uh, this is uh, uh, an area of controversy. Uh, you can see here. Um, this is just a pretty picture. I'm not going to discuss this any further. Um, we, I had one little hand in this. With the, I was part of the ADMET study, the methylphenidate for the treatment of apathy and Alzheimer's disease, and we started doing biomarkers uh, to, for prediction of apathy. And uh, I was lucky enough to team up with my colleague Lynn Beckris at, at the Cleveland Clinic, and we looked at microRNA because all of the now, this was actually a positive study um, of 200 people, 
the, the biomarker sub-study was only 60 people, uh, but looking at the use of methylphenidate uh, for the treatment of apathy. Um, really could be a whole talk in and of itself. Uh, but we did look at bio, trying to look at biomarkers of apathy, so-called endo, you know, the concept of endophenotypes. Uh, you know, can you look at people, can you, can your biomarkers uh, be related to uh, gene expression profiles, APOE status, uh, neurofibrillary tangle uh, density. So these are what's called endophenotypes in general. And microRNAs are non-coding uh, RNAs found in the blood. There's many thousands of different species, uh, and they may be affected by therapeutics. Uh, may affect the M microRNAs themselves may affect drug metabolism and toxicity. Uh, several species of microRNA, but this was a lucky luck of the draw because all of the uh, we got the smart you know the smartest people in the room. Some people went with lipidomics. That was a zero neuronal loss markers. That was a zero cytokines. That was a zero oxidative stress. Zero. These were small a small study microRNA. We were lucky enough. Uh, to get a hit on microRNA 1972, uh, which seems to have something to do with dopamine receptors, may also have something to do with uh, disease, uh, disease status. So this needs to be um, redone in a large, so we looked at responders, levels in responders, those people who responded to methylphenidate versus those who didn't, and there was a significant difference. Uh, you can see all the other species were were negative. Now, we did not do an unbiased uh, assay such as RNA-seq. Basically, what we did was literature review and then uh, picked uh, what we thought were the top hits and uh, based on literature review. Uh, so that was a different way of biomarker discovering. Uh, digital biomarkers are also coming, and these include language, computerized testing, and environmental monitoring. With language recordings, uh, there's a computerized battery out of UCSF called TabCat. It's actually fairly difficult. Uh, the digital pens, such as the Apple Pencil. So this has the possibility, for example, that you could know the X and Y um, parameter, um, parameters while doing a clock drawing test, that you could know the position of that pencil on the X, Y, in an X, Y plane at every second, maybe down to the millisecond, and use that kind of metadata uh, to see whether that will uh, improve our ability to detect early disease. Smartwatches, actigraphy, phone apps. Uh, you know, as soon as you start talking about phone apps, you start talking about whether uh, older African Americans who are living in the inner city, do they have smartphones? Uh, smartphone uh, penetration is Smartphones, there are several billion smartphones out there, so, uh, but they, there's, not everybody has a smartphone. Uh, and then we'll talk about environmental monitoring and integrated big data. Um, yeah, this is um, the work of Jeff Kay from uh, Portland, using ambient sensors uh, uh, in the environment and um, the CART uh, platform uh, using uh, many different things, activities of daily living, as a measure of uh, cognition. I was told by Jeff last week that the biggest predictor of mild cognitive impairment, they call these people every week, once or twice a week, and that the biggest predictor of mild cognitive impairment was stopping uh, answering the surveys. <coughs> So interestingly enough, that, that uh, uh, and it looks at walking gait speed. We know people with dementia walk slower uh, than their age match controlled socialization, phone call. <laughs> I'm sure the NSA has, could could tell us a lot about people with Alzheimer's disease making phone calls, meditation, <coughs> adherence, sleeping patterns, uh, physiologic functions. And then there's language. Uh, this is the cookie theft picture. Everybody uh, in neurology knows this. It was encoded into the uh, NIH uh, stroke scale. Um, now, it's probably out of date. We need better versions. Uh, this is, uh, uh, but the idea is that they look, can look at the, the use of verbs, uh, articles, punctuation, misspellings. I don't know if this was, how this was done. 
but you can see that the receiver operator curve is far from random. So, you know, developing better tests here is, is really an important thing. And digital, but digital is not free. Uh, it may be sexy, but it's not free. And this does take time and effort uh, on the part of both investigators as well as imposing subject burden. And there's tech, a ton of issues with technology, staff training, which version you're using of the test. Not everybody is computer savvy. A lot of older people don't know how to use computers. Uh, we talked about smartphones. Uh, the cookie theft picture is probably outdated. Um, data storage, you know, how are we going to store this data? How are we going to interpret it? Uh, the use of metadata, as well as the integration with other tests. And probably the way, one of the ways we're going to go forward with this is developing, is using uh, these digital biomarkers that parallel uh, conventional tests, such as recording category fluency and using natural language processing. Well, we did some of that, uh, and it's, you know, it's certainly possible uh, to do that. Uh, the other one is the clock drawing test, as I mentioned. Uh, you can do that with a digital pen and record that. You can get meta a ton of metadata. Uh, uh, you might be able to do this on your smartphone with your fingernail, for that matter. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, models and, and paradigms uh, uh, in, this, in this space. I did publish this thing on biomarkers and mindfulness. We're just about done. Um, mindfulness is the art of being actively engaged in the present moment. Uh, every, this is widely known in our culture. So I have my version of mindfulness. It's what are we trying to accomplish right now? And I think that this critical thinking is really important as we roll out biomarkers. And this is not just Alzheimer's disease. This is going to be Lewy body disease and frontotemporal dementia and uh, deep machine learning on M multiple sclerosis MRIs to try and predict people who have, for, you know, who have a uh, isolated optic neuritis. You know, can you look at that baseline MRI and and extract features from it that might predict uh, that the fact that you might develop more de uh, diffuse demyelinating disease. This is these biomarkers issues are generic. Uh, and, but really, really important because we're seeing them in so many different uh, contexts. If you're looking for an on-ramp, and how do I get involved in this, I would suggest that you go to agreedementia.org. This is sponsored by the NIH. Uh, signing up is free. They have a monthly webinar, um, one-hour webinar, and uh, you're free to join, and it's a very interesting group of people. Uh, it's called the Advisory Group on Risk Evidence, Education for Dementia, and there have a number of working groups uh, looking at symptomatic and asymptomatic. And these are the people who are going to write the issues around disclosure. We haven't even talked about the, you know, the difficulties. It's hard enough to interpret uh, even in the abstract, but in the, you know, how do we disclose this information? You know, your PTAU 217 and the plasma was elevated, so, you know, you're sunk. Uh, how do we do this in an ethical way? And how do we uh, put the guardrails on uh, to make sure that we're not doing patient harm? And so we, we talked about this. They're here in many neurological disorders. They're really informing us about the biology, but there's challenges. And, um, uh, and lastly, I'll make a plea and we'll take questions that Alzheimer's disease is about people. It's not really about $3 million machines. And we really, if you're going to take care of these people, you have to take care of them. And don't forget about the person and don't forget about the family. And we should learn from a lot of studies in indigenous populations and culturally isolated populations, uh, about avoiding cultural appropriation, a sort of a um, imperialistic model. We come, we take our data, we leave. Um, and, you know, instead of extracting gold or copper, uh, we extract data. And whose data is it? And how do we get a bit back? And the, this concept of seeing with two eyes is really a very powerful um, idea. You see it once with the eye from the point of view of the of the indigenous people, but you also see it with a scientific view. And how do we translate this? Because they their interpretation of this data may be quite different than uh, what we're saying.
you know, you're predicting who will be a better elder for the, our group. Or there, there, there's, you know, I think there's a, t a tremendous amount to learn. So indigenous, these are First Nations in in Canada, uh, Australian Aborigines. We're doing a study in uh, the Amish. Uh, you know, there are any number of culturally isolated groups um, that uh, might form the basis for uh, understanding uh, Alzheimer's disease. And lastly, all the people that I work with, and um, I'll take, I'll end there and and uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, that's very very powerful, and uh, uh, we appreciate it very much. I have to end Please. my share. I don't know how to do that. You can um, leave it. It's okay. Or, okay. Uh, Okay. Questions stop, that anybody stop sharing? Yes. So if if a, a healthy person who has elevated plasma P tau has a twenty percent chance of being demented in in six years, then many of them would not be demented by that time. And many of them would go on and uh, die from natural causes. With amyloid or with a with the tau pathology in the brain, but not becoming impaired. Correct. So my question is: many uh, more of them than do become impaired. Yes. Right. Yes. So that uh, if we use it as a diagnostic test, if I have a patient who's seventy, and his p tau is high, and he is demented, that could be because he's on the tra trajectory to get Alzheimer's disease, dementia if he lives 15 years more, but the reason he's demented now is he has a hypothyroidism or he has Lewy body disease or he has Pick's disease or PSP or something else. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it seems like it's not, I'm not clear that these tests are, are helpful if it doesn't, if it can't tell us what's going on at that time. Well, clinical evaluation isn't going away. Um, clinical, you know, careful clinical evaluation, uh, such, you know, they, you're absolutely correct that these don't tell us whether I have <clears throat> different pathology. We know from autopsy studies that most people, particularly in the older age groups, have multiple things. They have hippocampal sclerosis and Lewy bodies and amyloid plaques and, you know, microinfarcts. And so, um, care, the, the clinical evaluation this is not the clinical valuation is not just the entry point to biomarkers. I think a lot of this stuff has a lot of interest in research studies, but really its clinical implications, while somewhat scary, are not fully are not re being realized. And, and your point is well taken. So, um, I recommend uh, a book by Alberto Espe from Cincinnati entitled Brain Fables. He, he says that. There are more people who die who are not demented and have amyloid beta in the brain than who are demented with amyloid beta in the brain. That, do you agree with that? Uh, that's probably true. Uh, uh, so that the positive predictive value of this goes way down. Very good. We're we're pleased to open open up questions. For anyone, please go ahead. Alan, I appreciated your comment about the MOCA and uh, how this, the, 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 the thresholds are wrong. Uh, when I worked at the VA, I found that very few healthy veterans could copy a cube. It just wasn't something they, they could do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never understood this, the idea of subjective cognitive decline, but isn't, isn't that something that everyone has over the age of 70? If you ask them, how is your memory, they're going to say, well, it's not as good as it used to be. Um, yeah, I think that norms, norms change. Um, I think what we're seeing, though, is that a significant that it's highly pre we should be not blowing these people off we should be reassuring them certainly 
uh, but we should also be following them in our clinics. These are the people, you know, whether a year, two years. I've had this happen multiple times where somebody comes in and an older African-American lady came to me, said, I'm losing, you know, my memory. And lo and, you know, the family doesn't believe it. And lo and behold, she really developed Alzheimer's disease. And when she died, the family called me the day of her death and thanked me for everything I did. Um, but, you know, we need to really believe our patients and, you know, work them up appropriately, you know, whether it's, you know, if they're 57 years old and they come, for, you know, my mother had Alzheimer's disease and I think I'm not doing as well. What should we be doing? You know, should we be doing, I mean, my approach to this is uh, baseline neuropsychology because that those percentiles are really useful, especially as, you know, over five, 10 years and MRI uh, at least to have clinical MRI, uh, you know, and, you know, the case finding rate is very low in these uh, cases. You know, you're unlikely to, you know, you can take one look at them and uh, and tell you they're normal. In fact, what is one of the strongest predictors of normality of cognitive function is the patient shows up by themselves. <laughs> you know, where, where's your wife? Oh, I, I haven't told anybody, even my family. The, 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 it turns out that that's one of the strongest predictions of normality. However, I think we, these people deserve to be taken seriously. I think, well, you know, this is my little bugaboo, which is, you know, if I complain of chest pain a month ago, I get a stress test, I get an EKG, I maybe get a, you know, exercise stress test. If I if I complain to my PCP of memory problems, I get patted on the back and told we're all getting older. And uh, this is a major problem. You know, I mean, you see this every day in clinic. The, the doc, you know, they've waited three months for this appointment to see Dr. Remo, maybe six months. They come in, has anybody done a scan? No. Has anybody done, any, anybody done blood tests? No. Has anybody done a MOCA? No. I mean, we can be using that time much more effectively. But so this is a major problem. You know, I think it's a structural problem in the uh, in the healthcare system. Yes, I, uh, that's right, Alan. Thank you. Uh, one other question: uh, In Cleveland, do, can you do quantitative MRI, or do you still get a report saying the radiologist thinks it's a little bit too much, or there's not enough atrophy, or there's a normal atrophy for age? Uh, we do have the NeuroQuant program, and uh, that gives uh, hippocampal age, age specific hippocampal percentiles and uh, white matter percentiles and things of that sort, and uh, uh, ventricular volumes, and um, so that that we, that we do have a that. In fact, it's been underused, so we're but we are renewing our contract with that. Is is Adney doing any artificial intelligence to analyze MRI? People are starting to do that. Yeah, you know, definitely. Uh, you know, the, I think uh, this is the wave of the future for, and I think our neurologists need to understand things like deep machine learning, network analysis, uh, things of that sort, because I think it's going to be part of their career as they move forward. Very good, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Lerner? I would just like to thank you for this wonderful, um, inspiring information. And I, I took notes and I wanna maybe get back with you after I take a look at some of these things because we, uh, I do believe that we miss so many patients who need to be investigated deeply and you know we don't we need to get this out to the communities that um, they should take these patients seriously thank you very much you're quite welcome well thank you rob for this opportunity and thank you to uh lilia for getting this uh helping me get set up with uh blue jeans etc and thank you very much and have a great day Thank you, and Dr. Lerner will, and I will continue to talk. Anyone is welcome to stay on the call, on the meeting if you like. I have a few minutes. Uh, you have, uh, you have any, you have time, Alan? I have five minutes. I've got to get to the 
have some patience. Oh. I have a VIP patient at 10 o'clock, so, um, but it takes me 20 minutes to get to work. Um, did you like my little picture of uh, Leon Thal and Peter yes. Whitehouse? And 